please welcome to the stage Governor Kathy Hochul of New York and Patrick Gaspard, President and CEO of the Center for American Progress. Any New Yorkers here? A lot of enthusiasm. Yeah, that's right. Y'all can do a little better than that for our New York governor. One thing we're not going to talk about is our favorite New York State football teams, okay? Don't go there. It's been a rough year for all of us, okay? Uh, but there's always next year. You know, I'm a Jets fan and you're a Buffalo fan, so we have, you know, a little bit of... <laughs> Giants did well. It's a good year. That's right. That's right. Well, you know, Governor, you, you got the Voice of God introduction, which robbed me of my opportunity to kind of brag on you just a little bit. I want to congratulate you for breaking the ultimate gra glass ceiling in New York State with your recent uh, historic uh, election. It's phenomenal. You know, they, um, you have a rich history of public service and doing extraordinary work on the front lines of immigration reform and health care expansion and uh, even public finance uh, reform of our uh, elections. Uh, and you have been a, a phenomenal leader on paid family leave. So we thank you for all of that. Uh, and I'm so excited to be in conversation with you today. I'm looking forward to it very much. So thank you for the invitation. And since my days in Congress, we always followed what the Center for American Progress recommended. Uh, that was pretty much our talking points during our caucus meeting. So uh, thank you for all you do for, uh, to move progress forward in our country. We did not pay the governor for that uh, ad <laughs> advertisement. So thank you. Thank you, Madam Governor. We're, you could. We, you you know, could. We, are, we, are, we are celebrating the 20th anniversary of um, uh, CAP this year, and we're launching uh, with this event. And you know far better than anyone uh, that one does not make uh, progress without working extraordinarily hard. Uh, but you, f you get there by first being in the arena. And I know that over your desk, uh, you have repurposed the Theodore Roosevelt man uh, in the arena, a quote to be the... I have the woman in the arena That's poster, right. so if anybody <laughs> wants to get it, I have it in my office. Uh, it's an inspiration for me because, as Teddy Roosevelt said with that extraordinary speech, our business is not for the faint of heart. You have to be willing to be in the arena, sometimes get bloodied and marred and beat up a little bit, but it's far better than being those timid souls on the side, the critics on the side, who don't know the glories and the great enthusiasms of being in the arena, the wins and losses, so, uh, so that is something that inspires me every day. Thank you, Governor, and many, many more wins to come. And on that front, speaking of being bloodied but unbowed and being able to uh, emerge renewed, we all know, of course, that New York uh, went through extraordinary challenge uh, under, uh, th through pandemic. It was at the heart of the storm and the early part and at the apex uh, of the pandemic. In your state of the state address, you talked about all the things that are happening to help rebound and get to uh, the other side of recovery. I wonder if you could help us all understand what specifically from President Biden's agenda with the uh, infrastructure bill, uh, with the um, um, Inflation Reduction Act are contributing to pandemic recovery in New York State. No, what can you not love about President Biden's plan? I mean, it's extraordinary. And when you talk about how bad it was during the pandemic, just remember, it was the pandemic under President Donald Trump. So, so that's about as bad as it gets everybody. So we're, always, we're having to fight. Uh, the deniers and people, you know, absorbing the idea that vaccines were not a good idea for them. So we had a lot of headwinds to overcome, and even in our state. But uh, what President Biden has delivered, and we're so blessed to have Majority Leader Schumer from our state and Leader Hakeem Jeffries, so we have it all. And when they send money to us for child care, for example, we still have mothers who could not keep their jobs during the pandemic because I'm a mom, first mom governor of New York, I know that most of the responsibility tends to fall on the women in the household. Not fair, statement of fact though. So money from these initiatives at the federal level helped us be able to get more moms back to work by supporting childcare. The jobs, we've had a recovery. I've been governor of the state of New York for a year and a half. 536,000 new jobs in that time. So the jobs are starting to come back with the money that we've been using from the federal dollars to create those jobs. And even something like re-emerging into new industries, the Federal CHIPS Act to bring semiconductor manufacturing back from China, back from Asia to the place it was all started, we've been able to leverage that and have our own version of a green chips bill, which resulted in 50,000 new jobs coming from Micron alone in upstate New York. So, so we've been absolutely joined at the hips with our federal partners, President Biden, our leadership, 
to bring the infrastructure spending, the climate money, the child care money, and money to build resiliency because of climate change. All of it is being spent in New York State very happily by this governor. That's, that's phenomenal, Governor. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you to just pull on that last thread a little bit more, if you would. The Micron investment uh, through the CHIPS Act uh, was uh, extraordinary, 50,000 jobs, as you said. But I want everyone to understand that the governor comes from a part of New York that has been long neglected uh, by state leaders, by federal leaders, a place that used to be a vibrant industrial hub uh, that we're now trying to you know, get back uh, as uh, the center of the industrial universe. Uh, I want you to, if you could, talk about the Micron investment, talk about infrastructure in those neglected towns and communities, but if you would do it, not from a place of policy, uh, but from uh, a place kind of under the skin, because uh, you know these communities well, uh, and you are a phenomenal storyteller, and we are lacking in real storytelling around economic inclusion. Kind of ground us in those communities, if you would, no, Governor. I appreciate the opportunity. This is deeply personal to me, deeply personal, because I actually am the first governor of New York from Buffalo since Grover Cleveland. So we don't get a lot of representation outside the city of New York uh, in our state capitals. So that's kind of new for people to adapt to in our state, an upstater who's also a woman. Oh my God, what the world's, what's happening mm -hmm. here? But for me to be able to bring manufacturing jobs back to an area that when I was growing up, grandpa, my dad, my uncles all worked making steel. They were steel workers, part of the union, lifted our family out of poverty. My parents used to live in a trailer park. Well, my dad was able to get a degree, so I was able to see the transition from my family's own story, from tough circumstances to be able to live the, what we call the New York dream, which is even better than the American dream, be able to live that because of those good jobs. And all of a sudden, in 1982, all those jobs are gone. 20,000 jobs gone overseas like that. Everybody in my family, all my neighbors, all my friends' families lost their jobs. And I grew up from a big Irish Catholic family. Everybody wanted to stay in New York. I was the only one left because I was in public service. My family all had to leave. So to be able to be able to be the governor and say, guess what? We no longer have to say last one out of upstate New York, turn out the lights, which is what it was growing up. There are finally jobs and workforce development opportunities, good union jobs. Micron was heading out the door to Texas. They told me, well, it's too expensive to build in New York and labor, this and that. I said, what if I bring labor to the table, you sit down and you work it out and I'll make sure it happens. That's exactly how we took it from Texas. And I'll tell you, anytime we can beat Texas, whether it's in football or in driving, I'm happy to beat Texas. <laughs> Sorry about that. I'm a little competitive. So for me, it was a sign that 50 years of living in decline was finally turned around. And so some, the new kids, the younger people today, won't have to leave to go to other states in search of jobs. They can come right here to New York. So this could not be more personal to me. And I'm grateful to Chuck Schumer, our president, and everybody who made that CHIPS bill happen because this is not just a nice talking point, the largest investment in our country, largest investment in our nation's history at this time, $100 billion coming to New York State and taking the money back from China. So, so I, I will always... I'll go to my grave knowing that this is, was a turning point, a turning point in the trajectory of our state, and it's long overdue. I think that's what Joe Biden would call a BFD, uh, and I'm sure there were no Dallas Cowboys harmed in the process. You know, um, uh, Chuck Schumer, Hakeem Jeffries, uh, Governor Hochul is a pretty impressive trifecta. I would imagine that with the three of you, um, you're, you're, and, you're, and I know that you're incredibly competitive. It must be really hard for neighboring states now to be able to draw uh, industry uh, away from New York. You have a recent announcement in Tesla, Alstom, uh, the Corning Glass uh, uh, factory had recent investments uh, as well, uh, and IBM is investing tens of billions in semiconductor manufacturing of their high-tech jobs in the state. I wonder how the legislation that we passed last year uh, how it changes the pitch, the, the exact pitch that you're making to these companies to get them to double down the way uh, that Micron did. What's the, what's the business end of this, Governor? Uh, like you said at the outset, I would not want to be one of my neighbors. <laughs> uh, it's, uh, listen, I want, I'm not going to bet against any other state. I want them all to be successful. And that's why when the president talks about making it in America, that our supply chain is right here in America, that's what we're doing every day. And I won't keep pounding on Micron except the fact that I have places like Batavia, New York, little tiny Batavia, population 50,000. It's the biggest metropolitan area in that part of our state I used to represent in Congress. 
IDIS was able to deliver 600 jobs to Batavia because it's a company out of Great Britain that makes electric pumps that they're going to use for making semiconductors. So, so the ecosystem has already started. So what we talk about, the connection of what happens at the federal level helps me leverage our opportunities because people always said, well, New York State, you're a tax and Spaniard, but not business friendly. I said, we will be the most labor friendly and the most business friendly state in the nation because they can go together. Businesses want the best talent. I can offer the best talent. You come to New York State with that, that heritage, that legacy of hard work and great education and this willingness to just join a company and be a company person, but just pay them well. Give them paid family leave. Take sure, make sure there's child care. Take care of your employees and they'll be the hardest working people in this country. That's the pitch I make with using workforce development money from the federal government. Child care dollars, infrastructure dollars, everything that we're doing is a pass through in one sense from the federal government, which I'm so grateful for under the leadership we have now. But when that leadership wasn't there, it was dry times for New York. We, we had a struggle on our own. So I'm not taking for granted the support we're getting from President Biden and our leaders in Washington, who are the Democrats, that's helping us have this resurgence, this rebirth of New York State, where businesses, when I call them in other states now, they say, we're coming. And that's, that was never the case when I was growing up. That, that is brand new. That's, that, that's awesome. You know, Governor, one of the things that we most admire about you is that you're not the type to paper over some of the difficult uh, things. And uh, in your state of the state and conversations that you have, uh, you speak really directly about uh, one of the most significant crises that we're faced with, not just in New York, but across the country, which is the crisis of affordability for folks who are looking for homes that they can uh, buy or rent. Uh, and I wonder how uh, the investments that we're getting now from the federal government begins to change the equation uh, in how you're thinking about state policy uh, on housing specifically. You have an ambitious plan. It's going to be hard to execute. would love to hear the details. We do have a crisis in affordability overall, but housing being the biggest driver of that, like I said, when I was growing up in upstate New York, you didn't worry about the cost of housing. That wasn't that long ago you get a house for 87000 in Buffalo because there was no one else in competition for that house. In fact, it was probably a vacant house. And right now, people want to be in our cities and our small towns. It was rediscovered during the pandemic. People wanted to say, now let me see what the rest of New York State has to offer. But the challenge is, we have had the most restrictive zoning in the country. Restrictive zoning is what's keeping people out of all income levels. And, and stopping the opportunities for so many other people to have the great quality of life we have here in New York. So what you have in places like Long Island, wonderful place to live, incredible beaches, great educational institutions, higher education, a lot of technology, bio life sciences. Employers are telling me, I can get the talent here, but the talent can't afford to live here. Now, a place like Long Island, love Long Island, 0.5% growth in housing over the last decade. 0.5%. Now, we're in competition with suburban New Jersey and Connecticut and Philadelphia, where the housing has been, has been built over the last decade. So I've got to make up for lost time. 800,000 units I need to build like this and make sure that we're being creative, pushing our suburban areas to build more. And I've got some, you know, got, a, got an aggressive plan. You can read it. I don't want to give all the details. We're not making a ton of friends on this, but I have to, I have to win over the hearts and minds because we have an urgent situation. But even in the city of New York, affordability. If I want to attract young families to come here and they say, I'd love to, I've got a job waiting for me, but I can't afford a place to live, then we're failing. So I'm approaching this with an aggressive style, uh, put out a very ambitious plan in our legislature, and the federal government is helping us at many levels of that. But failure is not an option in that space. And I believe we can unleash the full potential of New York once we can start driving down the cost of living in the state because people want to be there. Agreed. That's, that's, that's bold, Governor. One of the things that we're determined to do at CAP always is to cross-pollinate some of the best policy solutions that, uh, that, that there are. But in addition to policy solutions, sometimes we need solutions for uh, our administrative bureaucracy uh, in our states. In your housing plan, you have this pretty aggressive mandate that uh, cities really need to be able to develop uh, the housing within a three-year uh, fast-track process. I wonder how you can help unpack for us the plumbing behind that, how your administration, how your various agencies pr provide both the support 
uh, the carrot and the stick uh, be, uh, behind that, and what you're doing to make certain that the most vulnerable residents of the state, those who have traditionally been left behind, uh, are part of that uh, journey. First of all, we start with putting money on the table. $25 billion to build 100,000 affordable housing units, full stop. No other state in the nation has put that kind of money on the table, but I believe that's an investment in our people, especially people that have been struggling, who just need to have that opportunity to live in good, safe, decent housing. It's a basic human right, as well as making sure that we have market rate housing and investing in so many different levels. So how are we doing this? I'm telling every community in the state of New York, if you're in upstate, you have to grow your housing stock by 1% over the next three years. You have to. And if there are projects, whether they're mixed use, affordable housing, transit-oriented development, which I'm leaning very hard into, we have a lot of great train stations, a lot of communities are serviced by our entire metro system in, New York City, in the New York City region. Those areas lend themselves perfectly, but if they do not accept a project that is meritorious because they just want to have exclusionary zoning, I have a fast-track appeal through the state of New York that we're establishing. You can come to us, developer, and as long as it meets environmental standards and quality of life standards and other benchmarks we're going to have, then we're going to prove it for you. And the communities that say, well, we can't afford the sewers and the roads and the schools that go along with growth, I said, I've got you there too. I put $250 million to start in a fund that will help defray those costs. I spent 14 years as a local government official. I did zoning. I did uh, housing projects. I know exactly all the ways people can say no, but I also know that they can get to yes. And I'm going to use that knowledge in my relationships with a lot of enlightened mayors and help them persuade the other mayors who are still stuck in the years past who think that their future can still be no growth is a path forward, and it's, they're just wrong. And it's, it's also that their own kids and grandkids can't live in the community they were raised in. And that's the challenge for all of them. I just have to point it out at a human level. You know, how sad, I'm a, good, I'm a new grandma. My grandbaby lives in Washington, so invite me anytime. I'll come back and down and see her. <laughs> uh, but I understand that deep family connection, because I didn't have kids growing up around grandparents, because there are no jobs, everybody left. And if you want to have your kids near you, and have a stable, beautiful neighborhood, stop saying no to more development and opening the doors for others to come in. So that's, that's just the, the, kind of the top level of it, but we've got requirements that every, every uh, half mile that's in a train station has to be zoned for housing, change your zoning. We're also telling uh, office conversions, you know, we'll make it worth your while to have office conversions, Mid Midtown Manhattan, that could be a 24 seven livable neighborhood. Imagine if we brought on high-rise buildings converted into housing, the flooding of more units on the market will drive down the price. That's how you let people be able who work in the city, who work as doormen in the hotels and work in hospitalities and young tech, tech startups and small, small business people can live in the same borough that they were born in, that they want to raise their family and they work in. And this, this is how you bring that connection. So again, everybody's saying it can't be done. I've been told that every single thing I want to do in my life, so I'm like, okay, put it on the list put on the list, and if I can have more thought leaders, you know, like people at CAP who talk about how this boldness is required now, because we're gonna miss the boat. People are gonna go elsewhere, and I can't let that be part of our New York story. We always are ever upward. Our slogan is Excelsior, ever upward. It doesn't mean stagnated. That's not sustainable for us. You know, Governor, I'm, at, at this point, I'm supposed to open it up to audience questions, but I'm going to abuse the privilege of the microphone for a minute longer because that, um, uh, that last response really compels me to, to take this in a different uh, direction. Instead of asking you another question about policy, uh, I want to ask you a question about temperament and the temperature of the nation uh, that we're in now and of your state. Last night, and I'm asking this from the, from the point of view of the radical optimism that you're always demonstrating in your uh, public service. Last night, we saw the President of the United States speaking about young people who are struggling with, with, with fentanyl uh, addiction, the things that we have to do to shore up Social Security and Medicare. There was heckling that was going on from the opposition party uh, in that well. Uh, at a moment when I think we need comity uh, in uh, our politics, when things like the infrastructure bill are intended to cr cut across uh, our partisanship, uh, given that you have tried, uh, to the best of your ability, to uh, make Albany a non-combat uh, arena uh, these days, I wonder how you're thinking about that spirit of coming togetherness and how things like the infrastructure bill can help us push through the cleavages that exist uh, in our society right now. 
I am very optimistic about where we are. I think the president did an extraordinary job reaching his hand out across the aisle, pointing out all the areas where we have a common interest, whether it's you know, knowing that there's so many families, Democrat, Republican, who've lost a loved one, including my own, to substance abuse, overdose. I mean, I don't know a single family that's not been touched by that. Areas like mental health, childcare, um, infrastructure. When I worked as an attorney for Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan a long time ago, the areas where you could always find comedy was on infrastructure and the farm bill. The farm bill had subsidies for the rural areas, but it also had money for food programs for the urban areas. So, so I've, I've lived that. That's how I operate, because I saw how successful it was in a different era, different political times, but I never lost that sense of great possibilities. And just as an example, this morning I had a meeting of my congressional delegation, Democrats and Republicans. You have a lot more Republicans, at least temporarily. Um, and a lot of them are from Long Island, meeting them for the first time. And we had a chance to really talk about some of the issues I just mentioned, and they want to work with us. They want to be partners. They're saying that. I will reach out. And again, I said, at the end of the day, is Democrat, Republicans were Americans first, and we're New Yorkers first. So that's what I'm going to continue to do, because to do otherwise and just say, well, you know, we're not, we can't get anything done until you know, this, these dynamics change in politics, there's too many needs that need to be met. The American people expect us to work together. They don't want to hear, but I, I was in Congress representing the most Republican district in the state of New York because I leaned hard into Medicare at the time when, you know, under a different administration, they're talking about cutting Medicare. I went into nursing homes and diners and VFW homes and said, seriously, your mom's not gonna have Medicare, your grandma's not gonna have Medicare? That, that was a area where a Democrat won in a Republican area talking about something that's universally loved. That's what we're going to keep doing. That's how we're going to take back the House. That's how we're going to make sure Joe Biden gets reelected. Just exactly what he said last night. Speak to the people where they are. Don't make it all fancy policy and one-point plan, two-point plan. People don't want to know that. Say, do you have my back or not? You looking out for me or not? It's that simple. Amen. Governor, your enthusiasm is a force multiplier. <laughs> with, uh, with, with that, uh, let's, let's get some questions, Billy. Um, our question from the audience is, with all the new job opportunities that are booming throughout New York, what is the state doing to ensure that those opportunities are accessible for the communities hit hardest by the pandemic, like women, the LGBTQ community, black and impoverished communities? We do it very intentionally. It's about where you're doing your recruiting to do the education and the tra training. So a lot of these jobs... Some require a couple years of skills, a couple years of job training. So we're going into those neighborhoods. We're literally building these projects in those neighborhoods. Buffalo, New York, for example, a large workforce development center is right in the middle of the east side of Buffalo, the most impoverished area, one of the highest child poverty rates in the nation. We built the training center in that neighborhood so no one even has to take a bus to get there. And the neighborhood is going to be lifted up by this alone. And, and the jobs are going to be attracted to people right in that neighborhood. So it's where you're putting the job training programs and the jobs follow. So that's the logic behind hitting those communities that were hit so hard, uh, especially underserved communities, black and brown communities. My gosh, from the health care disparities, which we're just, we're dealing with it now because what happened during the pandemic was a bright spotlight was put on the fact that we had higher mortality rates in those communities, and that was not acceptable, and we're fighting back to make sure that never, ever happens again. But those jobs, I can't wait to open the door to so many more people to have them, because as I saw with my own family, the dignity of a job changes everything, where you can go from immigrant grandparents who left tremendous poverty in Ireland to a daughter, granddaughter who can be a governor of New York. I want that same shot for every young person in New York State. I'm excited about it. Governor, because I filibustered just a little bit up here, we don't have time for any more questions from the audience, but I want to thank you for grounding us in lived experience. We have a way in, in the United States of stigmatizing challenge so that we don't talk about it and we think everybody just arrived the way they are in their success. Uh, and you've always been honest and clear about where you've come from and where you're trying to get us all to, uh, towards. And that's a powerful thing. And so thank you for that. Uh, and thank you for this. We appreciate you. Thank you.